Were you interrogated? Were there any any threats, direct or veiled, uh, made about your your future role in Pakistani politics? I think they know me. You know, this country knows me for fifty years. I mean, for twenty years, I was I was a leading sportsman in this country, and cricket is the biggest sport. And I was captain for ten years, so I was in the media for a long time. And then I went into philanthropy and built the uh, uh, the biggest charitable institution, which are cancer hospitals, and then a university. So people know me for a long time. Uh, they know that I'm I'm not going to uh, back down. But what they're doing is, you know, I mean, they have clearly stated to me, the establishment, that whatever happens, you're not going to be allowed to get back into power. So um, what they're doing now is that they are, they are dismantling the party. But dismantling the biggest political party, the only federal party in Pakistan, is dismantling our democracy. And actually, that's what's going on. All the democratic institutions, the judiciary, it is... I mean, the judiciary today is totally impotent in stopping this violation of fundamental rights. The Supreme Court, we went to the Supreme Court, according to the constitution, the elections in Punjab, the biggest province, which is 60% of Pakistan, was supposed to be held on the 14th of May. The government refused. So, I mean, even the Supreme Court orders are, are not listened to. The, the judges give, a, give people bail there, the police picks them up on some other cases. So this total violation of fundamental rights, which is going on, I think, this is, it's all an attempt to weaken me and my party to the point that we will not know, not be able to contest the elections because all the opinion polls show that we will win a massive majority in elections. Out of the 37 by-elections, my party has swept 30 of them, despite the establishment helping the, the, the government parties. So therefore, they know that in a free and fair election, we will just sweep. Hence, all these efforts are being made to completely dismantle my party and weaken it to the point that it will not be able to contest elections. This is a dark moment for your country, uh, for your party, as you said, for you yourself personally. But I'm curious, what are you looking forward to? In, in a best case scenario, what's the path out of this crisis? It's like a crossroads. One road is leading back to the bad old days of military dictatorship because that means you know, we will regress. The whole movement for democracy, which gradually evolved over a period of time, our media really, I mean, struggled valiantly for their freedom. And we had one of the freest medias. Uh, and then our, our, our judiciary, in 2000, our judiciary was always subservient to the executive. But in 2007, started a movement called the Lawyers Movement. And for the first time, we, the judiciary asserted its independence. So the, the whole pillars of democracy now are, are, are uh, being rolled back. The whole evolution, the this, this steady move towards a democratic country is now all at stake. So either we allow this to go where it is going towards a, 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 a military dictatorship. The other uh, is, uh, you know, we all try and all the democratic forces get together and strive for getting back to rule of law, democracy, and free and fair elections. As you confront uh, this potential long-term uh, military dictatorship, how does it make you think back on your own uh, support of the military in the, you know, the, per uh, situ the coup of Pervez Musharraf or, or having the military's you know, indirect support in your own election? Do you feel like there was a way to accomplish that without uh, the military, or is Pakistan in a situation that there, that reform is only possible through that institution? Well, you know, just to uh, make a correction, mine is the only party that was never manufactured by the military. Uh, People's Party, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, he served a dictator for eight years before he formed his party. The the other, the second party is PMLN. The 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 head of PMLN was actually nurtured by General Zia's dictatorship. I mean, he was a non-entity, so he was actually a product of his military dictatorship. Mine is the only party for 22 years from scratch I started and actually broke through a two-party system. In the 2018 election, the army didn't oppose me, but they didn't help us in winning the elections. The elections weren't rigged because it should be now obvious. 
Now, despite the, the army, the, the, the establishment standing behind these governments, we've swept 30 out of 37 by-elections. And all opinion polls show that we are way ahead of everyone, almost 60 to 70% rating. And, and the other thing I want to say is, how is it different? When Ayub Khan, the first military dictator, took over, the majority of the population backed him because at that time we were very insecure and the army was the bastion of security. When Ziaul Haq uh, deposed Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, uh, the second military dictator, half the population supported him. Half the vote was for Bhutto, but half the vote went against him. When General Musharraf wound up our democracy in 1999, he had 80% rating in Pakistan because he came on an anti-corruption platform. But this is a unique time in Pakistan. The almost the entire country is standing now for democracy. There are no takers for military dictatorship anymore. So it's a unique situation because we, our thought process has evolved to the point now where there's a consensus in Pakistan that a bad democracy is better than a military dictatorship. It feels like the military may see this crisis and this conflict as existential for them, that given what you've said, that the country, the po population has now turned against them, if they lose power, they may be pushed off the stage uh, in, entirely. And so cornered, that you may that may explain some of the reaction uh, that you're seeing. So how do you, how do you navigate uh, that situation where they currently have you literally and and politically surrounded, uh, but if you escape, they face an existential crisis. When I was in three and a half years in power, I mean, I recognize that, you know, you can't wish away the military. You know, you have to work with them because they've been entrenched for 70 years, directly or indirectly, they've ruled this country. So I work with the army chief. And apart from the fact that he would not he did not understand what rule of law meant or didn't want to understand. Apart from that, we sort of, you know, we had a working relationship. When and why he decided to pull the rug under my feet, I still don't know. I mean, at what point he decided that this is, you know, uh, I was dangerous to the country. Why he, he decided to change horses because he uh, backed the current prime minister who was facing massive corruption cases. And so why he decided to do that, I think my hunch is that he wanted an extension and, and, the, and the, the, the current prime minister had promised him that. I guess that's the reason, but um, really he's the best. He would know why, I don't know why. So my point is, you know, the way Pakistan has been run, a hybrid system, it just cannot be run like this anymore. We are now facing the worst economic crisis in our history. And my point is that, you know, when I've said, I've, I've offered talks to the, to the military, I've said, look, to the army chief, but so far uh, there's no response. My point is that the hybrid system cannot work any longer because if a prime minister has the public mandate and the responsibility to deliver, he must have the authority. He can't have a situation where he has the re responsibility, but the authority, most of the authority lies uh, with the military establishment. So a new equilibrium has to be made. You have to have some sort of an arrangement where you know, certain issues just have to be delivered in Pakistan. You, Pakistan cannot do without rule of law now because we cannot get out of this economic mess unless we attract uh, investment. But investment from abroad does, does, does not come to a country where people do not have confidence in their justice system, in the legal system, in their contract enforcement. And therefore, they go, Pakistani go and invest in Dubai and in other countries. But they don't invest in this country. We have, we have 10 million Pakistanis. If we could only get 5% of them investing in this country, we wouldn't have any problems. But, the pro but they, they do not have faith in our justice system. We are out of the 140 countries in, in the rule of law index, Pakistan is 129th. So with that sort of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, a lack of rule of law, I'm afraid the country's survival is at stake. So hence, a new equilibrium has to be made with the military establishment. Final question. I, I know you said that you believe that the driver of your ouster was was clearly internal and not driven from out, outside. But I'm also curious, given that the U.S. expressed its private approval for uh, for you to for you to be pushed out of office through a no confidence vote, I'm wondering what it was that you think uh, drove the United States to that position. Do you think it had something to do uh, with your willingness to work with the Taliban after the Taliban took over? Do you think it had something to do with the the war in Ukraine, or what? It, what is your read of the geopolitics that would have led the United States uh, to go from supportive uh, to willing to see you thrown out? Well, for a start, you know, the war Trump administration acknowledged that I was the one who consistently kept saying there was not going to be a military solution in Afghanistan. It's because I know Afghanistan, I know the history, and uh, the, uh, the province, the Pashtun province. Remember. Afghanistan has 50% Pashtuns, but uh, the, the Pashtun population is twice as much in Pakistan. And my province, where, where I first got into power, is, is the Pashtun province bordering Afghanistan. So I kept saying there would not be any military solution. Trump administration acknowledged it. And they finally, when, when he decided to the withdrawal, he understood there was not going to be a military solution. But I think this was taken wrong by the Biden administration. They somehow thought I was critical of the Americans and I was uh, uh, so, sort of pro-Taliban. It's total nonsense. It's just simply that anyone who knows the history of Afghanistan just knows that you will, they, they have a problem with outsiders. So the same happened with the British in the 19th century, the Soviets in the 20th century. Exactly the same was happening with the US. But it, it's just that no one knew that. And so I think that was one reason. Secondly, I was anti the war on terror in Pakistan. Because remember, Pakistan, Pakistan, first of all, in the 80s, created the Mujahideen. Mujahideen who were conducting a, a guerrilla warfare against the Soviets. So it was from Pakistani soil. And we, we told them that doing jihad Jihad means fighting foreign occupation. Is 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 a, is a, your heroes? It is a you know we encouraged it. Now come ten years later, once the Soviets had left, the U.S. lands in Afghanistan. You are told that this was uh, this was heroism to fight foreign occupation. How are you going to tell them that now that the Americans are there, it's terrorism? So that's what happened. The moment we joined the U.S. war on terror. They turned against us. 80,000 Pakistanis died in it. I mean, Pakistan, no ally of US has taken such heavy casualties as Pakistan did. And in the end, we couldn't help the US either because we were trying to save ourselves. There were 40 different militant groups at one point uh, working against the government. Islamabad was like under siege. There were suicide attacks everywhere. We had no investment coming in the country. Well, our economy tanked. So I think my opposition to the war on terror also was perceived as being anti-American, which is not. It's just being nationalistic about your own country. And with Taliban, I mean, when the Taliban took over, frankly, whichever government is in Afghanistan, Pakistan has to have good relationship with them. We have a two and a half thousand kilometer border with them. We have three million Afghan refugees here. And uh, when the Ghani government, before that, I went to Afghanistan, uh, Kabul, to meet him. I invited him to Pakistan. We tried our best to have good relationship with them. So whoever is in power in Afghanistan, Pakistan has to have good relationship because at one point, during the previous government, there were three different terrorist groups uh, using Afghan territory to attack Pakistan. The ISIL, Pakistani Taliban, and the Baloch uh, libera Liberation organization. Three different groups were attacking us. So therefore, you need a government in Afghanistan which, which would be helpful. So it was not pro-Taliban. It's basically pro-Pakistan as any, anyone who cares about his country would, would make those decisions. 